introduce myself. My name is Chris Kilpatrick. I'm a sergeant at the Public County Sheriff's Office, uh, which is in the southeast part of our state. Um, I'm a sergeant down there. I, I run our Special Investigations and Narcotics Unit. Uh, that unit kind of entails everything from large, large, uh, you know, high-priority crimes, homicides, serious assaults, things like that, all the way down to all of our vice and uh, prostitution, different things. Obviously, narcotics falls right in the middle of that, and that's what takes up a good portion of our time. Um, with me today is Detective Michael Hecht. Uh, he's my marijuana expert in, uh, actually he's a state recognized expert in the, in the field of marijuana enforcement. Um, great wealth of knowledge there, and uh, you'll be hearing some from him today as well. Uh, the presentation we put together for you today um, is just a real quick overview. Um, I'm not gonna get into anything real in depth. Uh, we've still got a lot of ongoing criminal prosecutions related specifically to marijuana. Um, in our area of operation, lately we've been seeing a very uh, high incidence of organized crime, uh, which has moved into our area with great force. Um, a few different uh, groups that uh, we deal with on a regular basis. We'll touch on some of those, um, and uh, you'll see some photos of some different things that we've been dealing with. Uh, some of those groups that we've talked about um, are, are going to be uh, Mexican cartel type uh, folks, uh, some of the Cuban, what we call kind of our Cuban syndicate faction, which is a very large organized crime portion we're dealing with. And then we've also got a fair share of uh, basic entrepreneurs that uh, aren't choosing to go the regulated route. Um, what do you want to talk about, Mike? So how we'll go over this presentation today, if I don't talk in front of the mic, can everybody hear me? Okay, so we'll go over the groups that we deal with mostly, the types of grows that they like to use, and then the types of harvest that they'll do and what they'll pro how they'll process the marijuana and where they go with it from there, how they courier it out in the final destination, and then when it all goes bad. So as Chris hit on, the three groups that we're gonna talk about are the Mexican cartels, the Cubans, it's a Cuban syndicate, really can't call them a cartel, but they're a drug trafficking organization. And then we have a lot of entrepreneurs that are coming to Colorado from other states that are taking advantage of Amendment 64 and Amendment 20 and operating illegal marijuana grows and distribution networks under the guise of medical marijuana. So the first one we talk about is the Mexican cartel. The first picture up here if you look at it, is a map. This is of the San Isabel National Forest. It's in the southernmost portion of our county. It's a very rural area of Pueblo County. And every little star you see there is a cartel girl, and it's in very rugged, mountainous terrain. Usually, they're anywhere from 300 to 500 yards off the highway, off a steep slope that you're talking at least 45 degrees or more all the way up to two and a half, three miles. They'll be off established trailheads or just making their own trailhead and come in and off the highway. When you finally work your way up into these grows, if you look at the picture that'll be on the right side of it, this is a grow in its infancy. We caught this earlier this summer. Um, we had re had reports of Mexican nationals being seen in the forest stashing gear. So me and my partners actually went up and hiked this mountain. And the only way we found this grow is we were walking along. We stopped to take a break to listen to hear what's around us and see what's going on around us. And one of the Mexican nationals pops up about 20 feet from us, looks at us, gets the old crap look, and then takes off running. <laughs> so as we give chase, we find out where his hooches are and his grow and his um, kitchen. And we stumble across this. Now in that right picture, you can't see the marijuana really, but is there a laser on this? A little button, red line. So these are how tall the marijuana plants are. There ends up being 7,000 marijuana plants in this grow. I don't know about what you guys see and you people in the industry see regularly or not, but as far as what I see for an outdoor grow with the Mexican cartel or these mountainous grows, they're usually producing about a pound of plant with um, very hazardous fertilizers. Some of the point that there is a certain chemical that they use that the Forest Service will even have to call the EPA in to do a cleanup and they'll have to do it in clan lab gear. So that's where that runs into. This is another picture of the grow on the left. 
It's just some of it that was more up in the trees. And this is how they camouflage their shelters. So the picture on the top left is actually where they live at. You'll have two to five individuals that'll live at this grow site for the growing season. That growing season starts usually about late March that they'll go up into the mountains. They'll start prepping the ground. They actually will full on terrace it. They ban the aspen trees, they'll ban the pine trees to make sure that they don't come back and they'll die. And then they'll take hand saws and cut them down because they don't want to make noise with power tools. They'll use those trees that they cut down and how they forage land and terrace it to build on the picture on the top right is their actual kitchen. They'll bring in propane tanks, massive amounts of tortillas, eggs, food, pork. They'll bring in all their fertilizer and a bunch of utensils and stuff like that and they'll build a full-on kitchen. Then probably I'd say 200 yards, 300 yards away from that, up away from the grow, so if they get caught or we come in and they're sleeping, that's where their hooch is. Their hooch is what you see on that top left, it's camouflaged, and on the bottom left, that's inside of it. They'll cut out the ground, make it nice sleeping areas, sleeping bags, and then they just leave this stuff there all year long. Once they start one of these clandestine grows, they'll continue to use it until it's discovered, and then after it's discovered, they'll usually recycle back to it every three to five years in case we rediscover it. Um, we call them historical grow sites and we end up usually going out and checking them every other year with either plane or physical surveillance. And we're talking rural, rugged, mountainous terrain. What do you need to grow marijuana? You need water. Where do they get their water supply from? They will go to natural springs, natural creeks that are anywhere from a mile and a half to two miles away uphill and they'll run your common sprinkler system poly pipe from that all the way down to their grow. Here's a short little video of the water supply. This was a mile and a half away from the grow I just showed you. See the lines? Poly pipe, ditched into the stream, took a Gatorade bottle and wrapped it in window screen to screen out any contaminants. And by the time it gets down to them, they'll have full running water. The way this grow was discovered is there was actually a farmer that uses this stream and collects the head of it at the bottom to water his cattle. Well, this was the early spring when we found out about this. The head of the water gate was usually around 13 to 15 inches. This year when he started to go water his cattle and use the spring, the head of his water gate was at five inches, which is a hell of a lot of water to use to grow that many marijuana plants. The next thing is, most hikers or anybody that's an avid adventurist knows when you go to the forest, you take everything back with you, leave no trace so it doesn't hurt our wildlife, doesn't cause any other issues. Well, these guys just like to dig a pit and bury all their trash, propane tanks, Everything that they have, they'll cover it with a sleeping bag, throw branches over it, and leave it there. And there it sits and rots. You will get animals that will come in and eat this stuff, then they get sick and they die, and you'll have bears, deer that have foraged on the marijuana that has been fertilized with the chemicals they use, they'll actually die in the grow. Not only do they do that, in this particular case, and I don't have a picture of it here, these guys were actually poaching the wildlife. They had a pet chipmunk that they had in a cage, but then they had several deer carcasses that they'd poached throughout the year to eat and live on. Then here comes the majority of my work. The Cuban Syndicate, as I call them. This is a very, very organized group of individuals that moved to Colorado to grow marijuana, to distribute it outside the state, all under the guise of medical marijuana. There is a large population that is doing this right now, and because of that, there are some active investigations going, and if you guys have questions about it, I may or may not answer them at the end. What they had to do is they'll move to Colorado, and right now you're looking at a picture on the left of the house. Picture on the right is the backyard of that house. This is what an illegal marijuana cultivation facility looks like to me. This would be a about $250,000 residence out in a rural part of Pueblo County. It's an old farmhouse where generations of farmers grew several field lands by, by it, and there's active crops going around it of corn and all your regular agricultural goods. The Cubans move in and they turn it into this. 
That shop you see is turned into a very elaborate dispensary and cultivation facility. So inside of it, it actually becomes two floors. They separate it into six individual grow rooms. They completely plummet. They steal power from the residential outlet as well as the extra power source that they had added by Black Hills Energy. So this house was fed by two 400 watt trans or 400 amp transformer services, which is usually what takes to run an IHOP or a mall or something of that scale. They take and pump everything in with their fertilizers. These guys were doing a semi-hydroponic grow and all their fertilizers and all that stuff would get dumped into the water in these tanks you see on the top left. And then when it was coming out of the plants, instead of recycling it like a true hydroponic grow would, they'd just dump it right out into the field of the farm growing next to them. So that was in all your produce. So like I said, this grow had in six individual rooms. In each room there was 25 marijuana plants. And in the top left you can see these are about uh, they would have started flowering them within about 30 days of the grow you see here. They run elaborate greenhouse control systems and controllers and in this one they actually made their own greenhouse controller and system. In the bottom picture you can see all the wiring that's huge fire hazard. They're using carbon filters, oops, to vent the air to avoid detection from neighbors because they don't want any of their neighbors to know that there's weed grown in there. They have individual ACs running for each individual grow room, as well as high pressure sodium lights with 1000 watt ballasts. The top left is one of the grow rooms in this cycle. These guys are actually pulling close to two and a half to three pounds of bud per marijuana plant. So if you're talking somebody that is growing 99 marijuana plants, just make it easy, 100 for math, and they're doing two and a half pounds of bud, that's about 2,500 pounds of marijuana that they're getting off of 99 plants. I know a lot of stoners and I don't know any of them that smoke that much marijuana. This is the power service that they use to support these buildings. Initially they're installed and permitted by our regional building department, but then after the service is installed, then they run all their extra wiring. On an outside note, something that was interesting with this group is they'd actually pulled all the permits in order to have this enormous amount of power run to the property. Um, when we got a hold of our regional building, because when, after we do these operations, regional building will come in and condemn the residents because nothing is up to code. And uh, we obviously can't walk away from that, leaving it the fire hazard that it is and have someone injured or killed. So when we got regional building in on this one, you know, I said, man, not for nothing, but what, when you guys text came out and started running all these transformers and doing this, what, what did they tell you? What was their reasoning for it? And uh, the individual that had done all the paperwork on this actually told them that they ran a business that they were going to be uh, refurbishing and rebuilding fire departments or fire trucks for local fire departments and for the sheriff's office. Um, that tells you the size of the barn and the shop that they had out there. Um, and of course the electricians, well, Okay, sounds good to me. Um, they didn't know they were going to get a visit from the county in the fashion that we visited them. But uh, it's just they're, they're pretty ingenuity. They've got a lot of ingenuity when it comes to being questioned on these things. They've, they're always going to have an answer that's going to get by the layman. Um, interesting folks. So when you see the, top, the picture on the left, that top box that you see, the big gray box, that's all that's installed when the regional building comes out and checks it. None of the auxiliary wiring after that is ever checked. So after they installed that box, you can look at their bedroom which is in the house and they take a nice piece of two and a half inch conduit and run it from the house's power source out to the garage to continue running more electricity out there. So this garage would be running on a 800 amp service. A typical residential house in Colorado runs on a 200 amp service. Back in the 60s, 70s and 50s, it was only running on a 60 or 100 amp service to give you an idea of the scale. They'll put the breaker boxes in, usually have to be clear for fire or hazards and people can access them because these breakers will get really hot. They just throw all their trash in front of them. They don't care and then that's how we discover some of them is they'll either blow up a power transformer with the electrical configurations they'll use or they'll start house fires and burn their own stuff down. 
these guys were so ingenious. I showed you the first picture of that grow or that backyard where you guys seen the shop in the back. That shop is actually two stories. They took and built the lower level as grow rooms. And what you're seeing here is a crafted elevator built out of garage door track, a pallet, and a chain hoist. This is the only access up to the upstairs. And when you ride the elevator, you get to come upstairs to this nice little industrial cloning area. This is set up so they can have cloning trays put on every single one of these um, center stacks. And the only one that they had going at the time of our execution of the search warrant is the one in the very back that you can see. Usually those cloning trays will hold anywhere between 36 to 72 plants. Just depends on the size of the one they're using. And they'd fill that entire upstairs with each of those cloning trays. So you're talking several thousand plants that could be in that one upstairs. Now, this is only one residence in this organization that I'm showing you. So what they'll do is they will have a cloning center like this to clone thousands of plants. And when they have a house that's ready for cultivation that they've just bought, they'll take, they'll buy it, and they'll build it to some, a similar area as this. Then they'll move those clones there. So they have no startup time. They're immediately in a growing phase. Once those clones hit 60 days and they've got a three grow, like a three phase cycle, they'll throw another set of clones in their first cloning room, cloning room so they can do a harvest about every two months, every month. Usually with these guys, we're seeing about every two months they're doing a harvest. The scale of the grow, if you go to any dispensary, I've never seen drying racks like this. And I've been to some huge dispensaries. Those are. Uh, there's four rows of eight foot by four foot drying racks and there's three high. We just did a cartel grow that had a similar size drying rack and it had about three, take one row and put leave three of them and out of that we pulled close to 350 pounds of bud off just the drying racks. Not only do these guys do this they are armed. So one of the big problems we have with these Cuban factions and these uh, Cuban DTO drug trafficking organizations is there's not only just the cultivation of illegal marijuana that's going into this. There's tax evasion, another nonviolent crime. But the one that the kicker is, is they do home invasion robberies on each other and human trafficking. So just recently we got contacted by the FBI on some Cuban individuals out of Florida that were wanting to come to Colorado and do a home invasion robbery on a Cuban marijuana grow in our Pueblo West area. Their plan was to come out here, tie everybody up, take all their guns, their money, and their dope, and take it back to Florida. And that's a lot of where this is going, is Florida, Kentucky, New York, and I'll have a map at the end to show you where a lot of our marijuana goes. So because they like to rob each other, they're all armed. There's actually been several homicides in Colorado because of these factions. One of them in the Warfano County area. There's multiple home invasion robberies. So there's a lot of violence that comes with this that's ancillary to the marijuana cultivation itself. The last group that we really deal with a lot, these are our entrepreneurs. These are the people that move from California, from Florida, from Kentucky, from any other area other than Colorado to come here to grow marijuana again under the guise of medical marijuana. They will put hundreds of thousand dollars into their operation and they will be in the profit in a very short period of time once they ship it out of state. This individual, again, had a legal cultivation facility and it's right here in the picture. It's his house. He lived there and I'll show you how he lived there. When you opened up his garage door, if you look on the left, that was his water supply. That's where he kept all his nutrients, fertilizers, and he had created his own hydroponic system and was actually selling it to other individuals and dispensaries so that they could grow marijuana like him. And he had some of the best quality bud I've ever seen in my life. He was quite the entrepreneur, frankly. He, he, he had a very, very nice green thumb. He also wanted to keep his cultivation facility on the low. So he would install his air conditioning units in every single one of his window wells instead of installing an industrial size um, air conditioner that, or a regular sized air conditioner for the house, for each grow room, he'd do the high BTU window units that were rated for uh, 1,000 square foot houses and put them in the window wells. 
On the top left is inside his kitchen. This was his processing facility. This is where once he harvested, he would trim and process and package all of his marijuana bud. On the bottom left is his bedroom. Okay, so on the bottom left is his bedroom. So this individual has been living in Colorado for a little while. I don't know, I doubt anybody in this room lives in a bedroom like that. Doesn't have any furnishings or anything nice in the house. His sole purpose here was to grow marijuana. He was so proud of his marijuana, instead of baby pictures, he had his bud pictures. <laughs> You're like, man, you have nothing, but I got, don't have any pictures of my kids in my house. Um, he was an interesting guy, and it was actually a, a beautiful home. It could have really been a nice place to live. Yeah. So in the bottom picture, you can see where his food saver, or his food saver, this was his bedroom closet, by the way. He had his food saver there with all the food saver bags and everything to package it, kind of keep it fresh. It also avoids detection and shipment because it helps conceal the smell a little bit. So on the top left picture, this is a stairwell going down to the basement. And this is where the cultivation facility was. So at the top, you'll see the little wires hanging. Those wires were part of his greenhouse control system. Everything in this house was temperature and humidity controlled. It was one of the nicest, it wasn't the best wired, but it was one of the nicest controlled grows I've been to. Yeah, when we went through this gentleman's property, um, looking at the equipment and some of the, the, all the stuff he's using, frankly, was top of the line. Um, and even in interviewing with this gentleman, he had in excess of about three hundred, three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars $325,000 wrapped up just in the basement of this house, basically. Um, so that kind of tells you what kind of profit margin they're looking at in that black market. Because um, he said, you know, I said, well, that's a big risk to take, man. If we come by like we did, now what? And he says, well, I'm not going to get into that, but I get one season sold, he says, I'm in the black. Said, okay. I've, if you I think about it, you. most dispensaries that are doing indoor cultivations, they're using high pressure sodium lights and a thousand watt ballasts. The ones that have the money are buying thousand watt adjustable ballasts. Mm -hmm. Now on the low end, they're running like $300 for a ballast and then about a hundred dollars for a light bulb. This guy was using technology I hadn't heard of yet. Instead of LED, he was using light emitting plasma. So if you look on the top pit right picture, the lights that are there are actually a plasma light with a thousand watt adjustable ballast to them. They were $1,100 a piece at the time of our execution of the search warrant. I don't know what they are now. We ended up pulling close to 72 out of this house. And this one actually presented us with a new hazard, if you will. Uh, we run into a lot of hazard when we get into these homes Next and start picture, doing Chris. the eradication. Next slide. Yeah. Um, it, you know, we got to deal with not only the hazardous wiring situations that they have, um, chemicals, uh, these guys will they'll emit CO2 and things like that, which drops our oxygen levels. Um, we've had some of them, and actually I believe he had in that other photo uh, where they can burn sulfur to, to, for pest control and things like that. This gentleman had these bags that we'd never seen before that were hanging throughout the entire, the entire operation. Um, at this time, whenever we were, this was early on in our, our process, we didn't really have all the equipment we needed. And uh, we had a partner with State Patrol that was one of their hazmat guys. So he was, anytime we were going to do these things, he was there with us and he's running around with an air monitor and checking our oxygen levels, making sure that we're not walking into a bad environment. And as we started doing the destruction on this and, and uh, eradicating this, he kept saying, man, I don't know what's going on, but our oxygen levels are fluctuating a lot. He says, to the point, I think we need to get out of here for a while. So we get out and, you know, kind of trying to figure out, well, we're not hearing anything off gassing. There, there's nothing running. We've cut power. What can be the problem? Well, come to find out, it was all these bags. Um, every time one of them would get disturbed, it was emitting, and I can't remember what chemical. Oh, it's yeah, it was just picking up some weird volatile organic compound. And uh, that's, this was his version of, of his pest control. Um, you know, and here we are in there and had no idea what we were dealing with. Um, luckily, the guy was actually pretty cordial when we kind of pulled him aside. He was like, hey, man, what might you have down there that could be causing us this issue? He says, well, you know, it could be. <laughs> yeah, that would have been nice to tell us when we asked you at the front end about any hazards to us. Um, 
but it's just a, it's a crapshoot every time we go into these things because it's always something different that we're coming across. Can I, can I ask, is there anybody in the industry in the room right now? If you'd raise your hand. So we've got one. So do you work in a MIP or a manufacturing? So you have a cultivation and a MIP. So with a MIP, with, do you use BHO? Uh, yes. Closed loop? Yep. Okay. How much did you spend on that system? Uh, pretty penny. To get it to split the <laughs> pretty penny. So what you're talking about, one place with a MIP, with a marijuana, a MIP is a marijuana-infused uh, production facility. So what they do is they will actually concentrate the <coughs> marijuana usually through like a bubble hash, they'll do an alcohol extraction, or what I was asking them about is a closed loop butane hash oil system. The reason they do a closed loop system, it's the only one permitted by the state for the fact that it doesn't off gas CO or butane and cause an explosive hazards. They're very, very expensive. Um, when I first started looking at some of the prices, just the extraction tubes, they're made out of stainless steel that are usually originally made to do lavender oil, were costing between forty to $60,000 just for the tubes. That doesn't include some of the other items that you need to complete the process. Well, this individual liked to have a BHO lab in his house, and he didn't do it with the glass tube and open can BHO. He made so much money, he bought an industry standard BHO extraction system. He had also had a vacuum oven. That vacuum oven at the time was around $7,000. He had taken an old Freon tank and instead of holding Freon in it, it actually held the propane in it. So he could keep reusing it and didn't have very much waste when he used his propane. So he had a very lot of money tied into this, and he was on a fixed income of $5,000 a month, but take it, just so you guys know. On paper, anyway, you know how that goes. Yeah. So again, we're talking about individuals that are cultivating and growing marijuana and processing marijuana for profit. So how do they get it out of Colorado? With the Mexicans, they have a courier that comes here, picks it up, and it'll take it back to their distribution networks. They will have hubs in major cities, usually along interstates and stuff like that. They will package it into bricks, and a lot of times it's referred to by narcotics detectives as a me Mexican ditchweed, because it's lower quality stuff. It's usually compressed, it's hard, it's old. Um, full of seeds, full of stems, it's junk. Yeah. Then you deal with the Cubans. The Cubans are a very interesting breed because they will take that bud, they will package it, they will vacuum seal it into containers, they will either mail it, they will sell it in state to a courier for a cheaper price who will then take it to another state to sell it for a higher price, so that's how he makes his money, or they will hire the courier to take the marijuana for them and sell it out there and pay the courier about $200 per pound that he transports. A lot of the states that he likes to go to are all the black. A big one is Kentucky. Um, up until this year, it was Florida. It'll reach New York, North Carolina, South Carolina. It's where all these loads are going. All these states that are in black are receiving loads of marijuana from Colorado on a daily basis. And it's coming usually from one of these three types of organizations. And when we talk about that profit margin and, and a lot of business folks in the, the crowd, I would presume, what these guys are able to do is by coming into our state under the guise of medical marijuana, which 99.9% .9 of the time is enough to get the local patrol cop that stops by your house to do an inspection because the neighbor's complaining. You show your paperwork, oh yeah, I've got my 99 plan extended count, here's my medical marijuana card, you're more than welcome to come in and take a look if you'd like. It was happening all the time with our patrol guys doing just that. You'd come in, oh yeah, looks good, and they'd leave. Well. A lot of them were these type of folks, where it's a black market strictly. Right now, on the street, a pound of high-grade marijuana in this state, we can go out all day long and buy it on the black market, depending on our time of year, anywhere between $1,200 and $1,600 per pound. That's given us a good cushion. These guys will come to Colorado, produce these copious amounts of marijuana, they transport that back to the East Coast and points in between, Depending on time of year and the locations and the market they're selling it in, they can get and sometimes in excess of six to seven thousand dollars for that same pound of marijuana that they could have got twelve hundred dollars for here. So that's how come the, the entrepreneur guy when he says, you know, I get one good season, I'm in the black. Well, there's no joke there. You know, you're you're making a lot of return on that with 
with some pretty good upfront cost. But and to give you an idea, some of the people I talk to that are in the industry when we do inspections, we have some huge cultivation facilities in Pueblo County. They're selling bulk marijuana at wholesale at around $600 a pound. So why is marijuana wholesale for, that's intended to be used in Colorado by Colorado residents, so much cheaper than marijuana that's on the black market? And the reason is, is because it's going to places that people can't have it. Supply and demand. Um, then we have, uh, this was an, an incident that took place in, uh, in our city. Um, it was a marijuana robbery. This footage is actually off of the homeowner's growers surveillance system. Um, yeah, this, a, this is what we talk about when marijuana goes bad, and this yeah. is what the aspect and the reason we focus so hard on marijuana is because of the violence associated with it. And usually that's left out. But anytime you have something that's worth a lot of money that's available, legal in other places, and it's easy to make here and take there, there's always going to be money involved. Wherever there's money, there's violence. And that's what these guys were after. They were planning on robbing this individual. Can you turn up the sound? Yeah, if we got sound for this video. Take a listen to some of the verbiage it's used. And they run off into the sunset. The thing that makes you feel better when you watch this video is yes, they shot the dog. Um, there was, you can't actually even hear all of the rounds that were going off in this. The sound on the system wasn't that great. Um, I believe there was in excess of 60 or 70 shell casings recovered in that short little gun battle. The guy inside the house is also shooting outside the house. Um, those individuals that ran off happened to be some guys that we just happened to know. So they got a very unpleasant visit from me and the rest of our SWAT team the next morning um, in a house about three blocks from here uh, where they'd hold up, they'd held up in there and look like the house was caught on fire with the amount of gas and stuff we had to put in that house to get these guys to come out. Um, they ended up you know, taking their, their criminal case and, and getting charged and doing everything like that. But the thing that worries you is, I don't know how many people in here heard it, but once that gun battle started going, one of the jamokes out in the street says, police, police. So that's the kind of stuff that we're faced with all the time when we go on a legitimate warrant service. You know, the, the police aren't gonna show up and just start shooting at you and then tell you we're the police after the fact. And um, unfortunately, when we go do warrants and stuff, we look a lot like these guys. We don't wear suits daily for work. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the way it goes. You gotta wear all of our gear and identify ourselves, but a lot of people turn a blind eye to the the issues that come up with the, the legal marijuana things. Um, we've got a lot of facilities in our neck of the woods. We've got about a 2,600 square mile county. Um, we've got almost 300 licensed facilities and going on about another 100 that are sitting still in the process of getting their licensing. We have zero issues with those folks. Quite honestly, we're thanked by those folks on a regular basis whenever we do come in contact with them because we're out knocking these kind of guys down because it's just creating a bad name for everybody involved in the industry, right, wrong, or indifferent. Um, but, you know, a lot of the folks like in, that operate in this realm, uh, right now Pueblo is leading the nation for a lot of things that aren't the best to talk about uh, for a community our size with violent crimes and, and property crimes and things like that. And, you know, a lot of the time you can trace any of that stuff back to some kind of a drug nexus whether it be marijuana or heroin epidemic or any of the other things we've got going on. But it uh, definitely hasn't, hasn't helped our workload any. Uh, we got plenty to do. So um, we're gonna have the Denver guys come on up. I think we might've run a little long. Um, and if we have any questions after the fact, we can take that from there. We got I, think, I think we got them. Yeah, yeah, you guys are good. They figured the cops can't stand still, so we're good. See if I can figure this part out. He might be. 
Maybe. <laughs> Slideshow from the beginning. There we go. Oops. All right. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Andrew Howard. I have the pleasure of being the lieutenant assigned to the Narcotics Bureau for the city and county of Denver. Um, I have the pleasure of being the lieutenant in charge of the three marijuana teams in the city and county of Denver. And what's interesting about those marijuana teams and what's important to note to all you guys is that we do illegal marijuana enforcement, right? If it's legal, we don't care. Will the voters, we'll talk about all that. It's very important to note, my marijuana teams, my three teams focus on illegal marijuana. Um, this is Sergeant Brett Hinkle. He is the sergeant of one of our teams. He has been there since uh, 2013 and we'll kind of go back and forth. And we're really thinking about what to do for you guys today. Um, talk about maybe something a little different that you haven't heard in years past. So we really want to focus on kind of the evolution of marijuana enforcement from Denver's perspective. Um, a, li a little history there. Um, in, in 2009, um, I was obviously much younger, right? <laughs> and you have to laugh at my dumb jokes, okay? Um, less gray hair, a little more fit, a little more tan, whiter teeth, I was happy. I was a sergeant on the night shift, crack, <laughs> meth, all that stuff. And one day my lieutenant walks in with this big stack of something. And he drops it on my desk and he drops another stack next to it and he says, congratulations, you are now the sergeant of the nation's first illegal marijuana enforcement team. <laughs> right? So being young and dumb, I said, hey, sir, uh, we don't have such a team. And he says, well, we do now. And off he goes. Right? <laughs> so that started the first enforcement team. And what he left on my desk were two very important things. One, of course, was Amendment 20. That was our medical, mar medical marijuana amendment that was allowing for dispensaries to really take off in, in 2010. And the second thing was a stack of over 100 citizen complaints that we had on illegal marijuana grows. Over 100 that we hadn't addressed one of, right? So I go home that night and think about turning my badge and gun and retiring, because who wants to deal with marijuana? But I thought about, okay, if, if we have 100 citizen complaints, and we didn't have a streamlined way for citizen complaint, if we have 100 citizen complaints on medical marijuana that's legal, we're not serving the voters, right? We're not meeting the, the will of the voters because there's something going on here. So that kind of started the, the evolution of, of the marijuana team. Um, originally, it was myself as, as a sergeant back then and, and four detectives. And it, it really, for lack of a better word, it, it really was a beatdown. Um, obviously, we had the dispensaries that, that came online under the caregiver model. A lot of you are familiar with that. In 2010, they were unlicensed, but they were, they were caregivers. Residential grows, citizen complaints overwhelmed us. Uh, and then we started getting complaints about illegal deals on Craigslist, Facebook. So out of my four detectives, most of them were about Donnie Brandon's age. So you have somebody like that that's done kilos, traveled all over the world undercover, and you say, hey, I need you to start buying marijuana plants because that's our complaint. Go to Craigslist and buy <laughs> marijuana plants. So it's kind of a funny story on this deal. We set it up, and I'm talking to Detective Brandon before the deal, and I go, Donnie, listen, marijuana's different. You have to get online. You have to study it. You have to know what you're talking about. It's going to be like a half-hour deal. You're going to have to have get coffee with this guy. It's going to be a young white guy, right, the whole thing. So he says to me, you know, I bought kilos all over the world. I'm fine. So we go, and we <laughs> do this deal. And during the undercover deal, the young white guy says, kind of looking at Donnie, like, what's, what's this old guy doing? As he's giving him the plants, and he says, uh, you know, what kind of lights are you using? Well, a lot of you, and a lot of you know, and, and Donnie's answer was, um, really bright ones. That was his answer, right? <laughs> so that really made me realize that we better figure out what the hell we're doing, and we, and we better get it right. So that kind of started the team. Um, and then, of course, caregiver model. Now it's all on your phones. Now you have little cards. I don't know if you guys remember these red cards. This is what we would have for our medical marijuana patients in Colorado. Um, and one of the challenges we had was the medical marijuana amendment said you have to have a bona fide relationship with your caregiver. I, I have no idea still what the hell a bona fide relationship means, to be honest with you. Um, now there's law that governs that, but those, those were the things that we would do. Patient counts. You guys probably experienced this. We had a lot of issues where we'd go to, on a search warrant, on a residential grow, and they'd have their patient <laughs> recommendations, their doctor recommendations over the walls. And we'd look at them, take pictures. We'd go to the next girl, and they had the same ones, right? It's because they were buying them on the internet. So luckily, with Marijuana Enforcement Division, um, sitting with the DAs and the city attorneys, we were able to kind of get 
headed in the right direction. Um, another thing in enforcement that kind of served us a blow was uh, a judge in Denver decided that each marijuana plant was worth about $5,200. So Amendment 20 says that we have to preserve the evidence until trial. Well, we're not gardeners, right? We're not green thumbs. So, <laughs> Not to exaggerate, I would be in a grow with these veteran detectives with 300 plants, but we couldn't take them, right? We know they're illegal, but there's a chance that they're, you know, medical caregivers, all that stuff. So we would have to walk away. So what do we do? We sit down with the attorneys and we draft and create medical marijuana plant sampling protocol, right? Just adapt and overcome. And that's what we did for a lot of years. We would sample plants. Why? my favorite friend, Will of the Voters. Um, I, I had a meeting the other night with law enforcement only, and the first thing that I said to them was, it doesn't matter your opinion about marijuana. It doesn't matter if you think marijuana should be legal. It doesn't matter if you think marijuana is good. It doesn't matter if you think marijuana is bad. It matters that the Colorado voters voted for it. Okay, That's what's important. So it's our job in enforcement not only to respect that, but also to enforce the law. Because the people that voted for it often are the ones that complain when it's done illegally. Feel free to try, chime in anytime you want. Doing um, great, this, boss. This is just kind of more <laughs> of our, our growing pains. And, and what's really, really important to emphasize is the collaboration that is involved in any enforcement action now with marijuana. It's so neat to see now that when we have these meetings with the Office of Marijuana Policy, with the fire department, that now there's a whole team that does illegal marijuana enforcement. Again, this is just illegal marijuana enforcement. I can remember in particular, I was in the basement of a house, I was standing in a couple inches of water, two or 300 plants, and there were wires, Romex wires, you know, going across the ground in the water. And as law enforcement cops, we always know what to do, right? When nothing's new, nothing surprises us. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I'm just like looking around these plants and there was a sulfur burner, and I, I pulled out my phone and I didn't have zoning. I didn't even know how to call the fire department, right? And I'm a police officer. So my brilliant idea was I'm gonna go turn the power off. So I go outside my wet feet and I turn the power off and the power doesn't go off, right? Because like the Pueblo <laughs> guy said, they, they drilled under the house and connected to the power. So Excel came and, and turned it off and told me that, that, that I almost died. But after that, we decided <laughs> we got to figure this out, right? We have to have partners in the illegal side. So, and, and Brett, after I left for a few years, uh, and Brett will talk about that, the cl collaboration with the other agencies in your cities and the citizens is key, right? Our whole goal is to serve the citizens of the city, county, and Denver. And if I am not handling an illegal grow, that potentially can cause a fire or a home invasion that you saw, because they happen here, I'm not, I'm not doing my job. Um, another interesting thing, and, and some of you might know um, the attorney there, the picture of, of Mr. Corey, we go inside of Marijuana Grow, and there's a letter here on the wall, and it says that I have to get my search warrant approved by him before I go in there. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I didn't know that I have to do that. You know, call the attorney. No, of course you don't know, call my attorney. Yeah. Um, it's just growing pains. Just something in law enforcement you never really, really seen before. Um, 2012, the feds decided to step in, which they don't often do, but they stepped in with a thousand foot rule between um, rec centers and schools. There were four, and this was, I believe, before Ashley's team uh, came on board. So there were 41 dispensaries that were closed by the feds. And that's the biggest action that I've ever seen against dispensaries in Colorado. So they came out with their little roller thing and measured 1,000 feet, and, and those people were forced to close in the city and county of Denver. Um, just kind of continuing on, training, right? We had to educate ourselves. I can't tell you how many hours and hours I spent um, with, I don't think any of them here, with the DAs and the city attorneys. We would sit in our office with Amendment 20 and later uh, Amendment 64, and we would go line by line and read the law. Right? And, and why did we do that? Will of the voters. I don't want to bring bad prosecution. I don't want to set bad precedent, and I don't want to charge somebody that doesn't need to be charged. On the other hand, I need to enforce the law so the citizens that live here can enjoy their quality of life. So I can tell you how many hours we spent. I used to, people used to tease me. I used to sit at home and just read it over and over and over and over and over just to make sure that we, that we were doing things right. And that's something that really, really formed our relationship. Now with the district attorneys and the city attorneys, Brett and his teams now, a detective can call the deputy district attorney at midnight and, and she will answer her phone. That doesn't happen, folks, in a lot of cities. And, and that's fabulous. And a lot of times we'll call her and she'll say, no, goodbye, and hang up. 
You know what? <laughs> That's just as important, right? Because you as the citizens, you want all these checks and balances. And, and I can tell you in Denver, you, you have them. Um, there we are. Will the voters, right? That's why we do this. And I'll probably beat this drum a little too hard today, but I have to remind myself, right? This is what the voters wanted, so we need to protect it. Um, this is something that we couldn't have planned for. And, and in law enforcement, there's not that much new. You can only go on so many car accidents, so many shootings, so many homicides. You, you really don't see something new. With marijuana, we have seen so many, so thank you to some of you in the industry, we have seen so many new things that just shock us sometimes. Um, so unintended consequences. Brad, you kind of want to go through a couple of these? Sure. <laughs> um, you guys are all liking our weather here in Colorado. We don't normally get this, but it's harvest season, guys, for our backyard grows. And I feel lucky now after seeing these guys from down here, down south, because this is my little grows that we deal with, but we're in a landlocked city, so these are very important to the neighbors. Um, this is right next to residences. So the one over here on the right with the gentleman in the suit, that's one of our detectives. And there was a five-year-old kid running around back and forth from inside the grow over there. So you're seeing a lot more child abuse and stuff like that. This was, I think, an 84-year-old guy growing. Um, the problem we see with these, I don't know if there's next slides, boss. Um, but basically with the backyard grows, we're seeing a lot more violence associated, just like these guys stated. Um, seeing people jump fences because all the marijuana is money. So people are stealing it and it's getting over the fences now. Most of the time they've cut down the backyard grows at this point, but we still have some in November. This was in November that we took this photo. This was probably within a thousand feet of a school. Kids were walking home from here and this was uh, in November 1st and buds were dropping off of the plants from right there. And I, and I talked to the people, they were real nice people, drove a Subaru, but they were real nice. Um, and, <laughs> And I asked them, I said, why, why, did, why are you guys growing plants out there? And they said, oh, we just, we thought it'd be for fun. We just did it as kind of a, a, a joke or whatever. And I'm like, well, you understand. So um, that was before we had some of the strict laws that we went, went into place. But um, that's one of the big problems we're dealing with right now. Um, hash labs, I don't know if you guys have a lot of those. We have a lot more hash labs and we have more hash lab fires now. Everybody's seen the news. Everybody's probably heard of a hash lab fire. Well, we get, I get called at two in the morning a lot of times and luckily I call my boss, but um, we're seeing a lot more of those because people in Colorado now don't just want the flower, they want something stronger. And what do you get with stronger? You do, you do extractions. So this was a extraction. These are, this was a fire at an apartment complex, um, burned three floors. Um, actually nobody died or got hurt seriously in that, in that one. Um, these are the kind of things that we're seeing um, I don't know, sir, who is the sir in the, uh, the license place over here, somebody? Is that what yours looks like, anybody? No, these, these are both, um, like these gentlemen said, cops go inside and they don't, they don't have the education, so they see something like this, and it looks pretty legit, and then the people produce paperwork, they have a business license for whatever, and the cops walk away, so we've had, we've had to do a lot of training on that. And, and like Brett mentioned, the, the training really, really not only was the key, but is the key, right? We want to train our patrol officers so they can educate our citizens. And, and I'll talk towards the end, unless we run out of time, is the education piece we've been really trying to push out is, like, know before you grow. Know what's legal. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just important for the patrol officers, right? So when the patrol officers go to the house, they can give accurate information. Because the worst thing is for the citizens, whether they're growing or consuming or being affected as a neighbor next door, the worst thing is not to get accurate information from the cops. So we really, really push to do training. Um, I have these guys go to the academy. Each academy class gets eight or 10 hours of training just on marijuana, which believe it or not is a lot. Um, just so they know, not only for the enforcement piece, but more importantly, for the education piece. So they can show up and say, yeah, you know, what you're doing is legal, what you're doing is not legal. Because really, I don't have big desire, actually I don't have any desire, I might get in trouble for saying that, I don't have any desire to put these people in jail that are not doing this intentionally at all. I'd rather them get educated and know what they're doing so they can just move on and, and we can move on. Um, this one's interesting and Brett can tell you a lot about this one as a couple guys mentioned and, and we're not going to talk about it too much because we have a lot of ongoing investigations, but being uh, in narcotics for 12 years, I have seen more guns in marijuana grows than anything else. Out of all the, and my years on the SWAT team, and all the crack houses I've hit and meth labs I've hit, 
you know, you would get a little Raven 25, maybe. But in the marijuana grows, because of the value, these guys are really, really defending their grows. Yeah, so this one with the SKS over here was actually right next, next to DU University, literally right across the street. And DU University is Denver University. It's one of our more affluent universities. Um, so this guy, um, we actually got on because of, uh, so he was doing anti-Obama graffiti and was kind of a zealot. But um, one of the problems we had in law enforcement is, I don't know how these guys do it, but we can't use our SWAT team a lot of times for search warrants. So we waited for him uh, for a little while, sometimes on, on this. But um, they're arming themselves with, with, this was his grow here. So a lot of these people arm themselves a lot more. And again, we're talking about the unintended consequences. So, you know, the, the edibles, and I don't know, have you guys had a class on uh, marijuana psychosis? Anybody talk to you guys about that, any physicians? Um, we've had some instances here in Denver, and I, I think I have a few slides on those. Um, but, but originally, and now I have to say, the industry does a great job regulating. They really, really, really do. We do undercover operations for liquor and marijuana. When I send my underage cadets in to try to buy liquor, or try to buy marijuana from dispensaries. And I can tell you on the last one that we did, no dispensary sold to the undercovers. I actually wanna go hug them because that's what I want. That is my goal, right? 100% compliance, that is my goal. I don't, I don't want them to sell to the kids. So I, I was really happy about that. But originally when edibles really took off, we started having a lot of problems. I mean, look at this. These are edibles that we were all buying and Brett's team was buying online. How do you know what's in that, right? These were actually from a 420 event that we had several years back where people were bringing them to the park and trying to sell them um, the homemade stuff. So obviously you don't know what that is. Um, this guy was buying stuff and selling them at 420 and also taking it back. I think he's from North Carolina or something. So, um, so, so the next two, you've, I don't know if you've, you've heard of uh, uh, Levy and then of course um, Mr. Kirk. And, and those are two people that suffered marijuana psychosis, and, and we don't need to get into that, but that was diagnosed. Um, Levy took an edible from, uh, that somebody bought for him and gave to him, which was illegal because it wasn't 21, from a dispensary, took a small piece, which was the, the correct amount, didn't get high right away, didn't feel it was enough, ate more of the cookie, didn't feel it was enough, ate the whole cookie, jumped out the window of the hotel, and, and, and that was it. So uh, Mr. Kirk, um, I won't get into that, marijuana psychosis, OD'd on, on edibles, didn't follow the rules, and ended up, uh, unfortunately, killing his wife in front of, in front of the kids. Um, another unintended consequence, of course, vaping. You know, vaping is a, is a huge industry right now um, in Colorado, and it's difficult when you see somebody driving, right? How many people driving on Colorado see people vaping or wherever? You really don't know if it's cannabis, right? Or if it's summer breeze. We have no, and, and we don't know either. This was yours. So this is one that um, actually Marley, I think she's around. She helped us out with. We went with the, the fire guys. We always joke with them and they joke with us, but they did a great job on this. So this was over a million dollar extraction machine. Um, they were doing hemp. That's another problem we will probably talk about here in a little bit, but they were doing CDB unlicensed. Um, the guy had a PhD, real nice guy, uh, real cooperative, but we got inside there and I couldn't believe it. So that's, that's the other things you're gonna, possibly see if when legalization happens. Uh, tinctures, I don't think we're seeing so much of tinctures anymore. When we first started, we're seeing a lot of that. Um, Dabs, of course, everybody knows about that. Um, illegal sales, Craigslist, Facebook. Uh, the reason that I like to talk about this is the violence associated. And the truth is we don't know all the violence associated. We have in Denver homicides related to illegal drug sales on the internet. We know that. What we don't know is how many robberies are really going on. We know they're happening, but when you go to a drug deal and you get ripped off and a gun put in your face, you don't always call the cops, right? So it's kind of hard to track. So what we do, and again, we're all complaint driven. My teams, we sit on between 60 and 80 complaints all the time, citizen complaints. We're hammering through, hammering through, hammering through. We're getting more, getting more, getting more, getting more. So when we start getting a lot of these complaints, so out of the last four undercover Craigslist deals that we've done, three out of the four, the sellers were carrying guns. And one, the man had a gun, the wife had a gun, and the five-year-old we brought for the drug deal had a toy gun in her hand, which was very disturbing. Um, but this is what we're dealing with, and the reason is is because they're getting robbed, or they're robbing. So, so those are just the unattended consequences that we're dealing with in Colorado. 
and, and I'm not sure, I'm sure actually I'm hoping you guys had a class on the, on, on the social clubs, but this is something we're dealing with as well, right? What's public, what's private, it's just part of the future. And again, there's my friend. This is all the will of voters, <laughs> right? We voted for legalization. Did we really anticipate, and forget the legal industry, because I, like I said, they're not a big problem for us, but did we really anticipate all these problems? Somebody said yes, I heard an echo. Um, Brett, that's... Oh, the party bus. So this is an, another problem that we didn't intend on and weren't sure about. We'd have events, and then they'd have a huge bus that would pull up in front of these um, events, and they'd have a liquor license inside, but then people would go outside and smoke. And um, remember our chief coming to me and asking me, hey, is that legal? Uh, <laughs> you don't want to say, I don't know to the chief, but we had to do that. Luckily, Marley helped us out with that. Um, and, but that's one of the things that's kind of a, a gray area with, um, with Mar Colorado marijuana law. This was the interview, this is one of my uh, favorite things. Our chief, our same chief came over to us and said, hey, they're gonna have, uh, what's his name, Seth Rogen's gonna come out here to Denver for his big pr premiere of the interview, um, and they say they're gonna smoke weed inside um, this theater. Obviously, that's, if it's not a private event, that's illegal. So we had to go in and talk to them. And actually, the people that owned, I think it was the Oriental Theater, were very cooperative. Um, and they ended up not doing that in there. But everybody was booing the cops for that. So, <laughs> so here's another unintended consequence. This is inside a house. This is an illegal residential dispensary. Talking to LA this week, they have a lot more illegal dispensaries uh, than we do. I'm sorry about that, guys. But uh, this is just one of the ones. Um, that we have. This is somebody's residence. Obviously, they just buy this stuff on Craigslist or whatever, the countertops, and, and, and there they were. It's completely illegal, right? Um, caregiver model, I think we'll kind of go ahead. You know, caregiver grow, we talked about that. Um, here's the government, right? Ogda memo, something that we, we hang our hat on sometimes, a coal memo. Um, pesticides, you know, that's the big unknown. That's the big unknown for us. Luckily, in the, in the commercial grows, for the most part, you know what you're getting. In the residential grows, when you're buying on Craigslist, you don't know what you're getting. You don't know what they grew it with, what they sprayed it with, if they're using sulfur, any of that stuff. I think you wanted this one, Brett. So this is a big investigation that um, when he was the sergeant, they, we started with the DEA, um, and it was called Phantom Pain. You can probably look it up. Um, but it, it, it got really big for a while, and then it kind of fizzled out. So it had a local attorney nexus with it. And actually, that was Cubans as well. Um, that was one of our Cubans first started happening. So, Yeah, um, sampling pants, we talked about that, just plant sampling protocol. So you can see all those plants by their feet. Those are plants that we knew were illegal, but at the time, we, we couldn't take. Will the voters, right? Um, free marijuana giveaway, right? In public, at the park. Is that a problem? That's a hell of a problem, right? Um, this, is, this is important to note, especially those of you that are in, in uh, you know, work for your cities or work for city government, is the plant destruction and the cost. So when we started realizing that when we were walking away from these grows, that we weren't doing anybody any good. We weren't really meeting the will of the voters because we were leaving the product. We knew it was illegal, so luckily we worked with Marley and the district attorney's office and we were able to get things in place where we could start taking the plants. Well then, can you imagine being the property bureau clerk for the Denver Police Department, and I show up with 100 boxes of fresh marijuana plants, right? What do you do with that? You have to have to be prepared. Originally, we stored it. Well, that's all mold in a box there. That's one of our boxes. Anybody thinks that's a good idea? I, I, that's crazy. So we had to start figuring out, okay, what do we do? We sample, we weigh, we get the crime lab on board. We used to take it to the Denver airport and burn it. Well, they would only burn 10 boxes a week. I think Brett's team, I don't know how many boxes a week you think you do now of illegal marijuana. <laughs> a lot more than that. Yeah, probably 70 to 100. So we had to get organizations and groups where we could start shredding it and destroying it, get the DAs on board that we could weigh it correctly and, and have it all. But that's something that, that we didn't think about. Uh, something else we didn't think about is if Andrew Howard is arrested in your community for fishing without a license and I'm going to go to jail, but I have half an ounce of legal marijuana in my pocket, right? I can't take it to jail with me. So what do you do with it as, as law enforcement or city managers? Where do you put that? Do you put that in your property bureau? Well, it's my personal property. You can't destroy it. What do you do with it? So that's something that I'll be happy to talk to you offline about. We really, really worked through. But I can tell you at one point, and not anymore, we had almost 10,000 items of personal property marijuana in our Denver property vault. 
So think about the space and manpower for that. So those are the growing pains that, that, we, that we went through. Um, and, and many, many more. Many embarrassing, but I'm not going to tell you those. Um, the cost of pulling the plants. The first picture I showed you, the much younger me, we were wearing jeans and t-shirts, right? Like the old meth lab days, we used to pull plants in jeans and t-shirts. So what was the exposure? What was the exposure of the pesticides? What was the exposure of the mold? And luckily, um, this is just crime lab testing, edible testing. Um, luckily now, our detectives wear full pappers. But to outfit one detective to pull plants, what, is it, what does the system cost now? Probably with everything, four grand maybe with everything. Right, four grand for one detective, right? And, and we have 15 or 20 of those suits just to protect the officers, right? Um, 420 concerns, everybody knows about Colorado 420. Um, that's an actual picture that we took from the front of the crowd. Um, citizen complaints. So, so let me tell you about statistics, and I'm very, very, very careful about statistics. <laughs> statistics scare me. I'm so careful about statistics. If you ever ask the Narcotics Bureau, Bureau for statistics, we do our best to make sure they're accurate. Okay, I, I really, we have a full-time analyst. Do we have a picture of Dan in here? I don't know. We have a full-time analyst that all he does is marijuana-related statistics. Um, this year, Brett's teams have investigated 184 citizen complaints, majority about illegal grows, and that's just in the city and county of Denver. That's what they've investigated. That's not what we're still holding. So it can just show you how busy we are and how much we're trying to support the will of the voters by investigating those illegal complaints. Um, what we've really done uh, well, I think, is we've streamlined the complaint process. It used to be if you called and said, the marijuana plants are hanging over my fence from my neighbor's yard, a patrol guy would drive by, and if he didn't see it, you know, he's got domestics, he's got all kinds of stuff, he would just move on. Well, we've streamlined the complaint process, which they probably hate me for. Now all the complaints come directly to us, so we're able to, to address them, you know, uh, quicker and more completely. Um, black market marijuana, I had a good argument with somebody about this, and, and I know we're running out of time. There's no such thing as gray market marijuana, so get that out of your minds, okay? If I have a prescription for Oxycontin, because if you have a prescription for marijuana, if I have a prescription for Oxycontin and I sell it to Brett and he doesn't have a prescription, right? That's illegal. That's black market sales. In Andrew Howard's opinion, it's the same for <laughs> marijuana, okay? There's no gray market. Gray market, they like to say, is when you're a caregiver and you have extra marijuana, so you sell it online. That's illegal. That's black market. If we catch you, we are going to charge you for that for distribution. Here's my friend. I put him in a lot, didn't I? Um, diversion is huge, Pueblo talked about that, the cost out of state, that is our biggest problem with the residential grows. The residential grows that we're going to are not the people that are growing six to 12 plants. We're so happy when we come in and grow and they have six plants. Absolutely. How often does that happen? <laughs> uh, not 5%, often. 5% of the time, maybe. Yeah, I want to hug them too. There are other people on the list of people I want to hug because they're doing it right and I don't care. It's diversion. It's people coming here, mailing it out of state, mailing it out of state, just constant. That's the big thing we have is the three to nine pound packages of weed being mailed every day, every day. My interdiction guys did an operation with Postal last night of people randomly just mailing packages out, out of state through USPS. Well, there's my interdiction slide. Um, interdiction has changed. I, I supervise a unit with one sergeant and five detectives that all have canines and all they do is interdiction, planes, trains, automobiles, buses, and now marijuana is 70, 80% of their business, marijuana and money. And it used to be cocaine, meth, but now it's all marijuana going out of state. Um, got this one, buddy? So this one was a, an actually um, on Metro, one of our uh, university campuses. Um, the, their police star department contacted us. This gentleman actually jumped, um, had an open dumpster from a licensed place, jumped inside, took all the leaves out of their bag, stuffed it in there because it wasn't locked, um, went over to the college, and you can see what a good looking guy he is, but he's, he's trying to sell it to all the people in the university, so they called us. So we've got illegal dumping concerns from licensed facilities. I think it's been cleaned up quite a bit, but that was probably three or four years ago. Um, I think I'm gonna skip ahead because we're kind of running out of time. Um, postal. Um, you know, really, this is the key for education. That's something that we're really trying to push out. The Office of Marijuana Policy is really trying to push out. Is how do we educate, right? The citizens, the students, the officers. Just like anything new, we all need to learn. Well, we shouldn't be scared to talk about marijuana. We shouldn't be scared to educate, you know, people about that. 
Um, key relations, we talked about that with the other agencies and everybody else. They really uh, make our lives and your lives as citizens better. It's a nice picture of you, buddy. I know, you like that? Did you sleep on that one? <laughs> um, you want to just give a quick two, three minutes? Just real quick. What you guys do? Um, when he left, he was kind of a legend in the department, so they, yeah. they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And um, so I went there, and I wanted to be like a narc, so I grew a nice little beard. My wife loved that. Actually, she hated it. But um, So I took over for um, Lieutenant Howard. Used to call him a lot. Um, the first, first week, they bring me up to the chief's office and say, hey, we're going to have an online chat with everybody from the nation. Um, so you know marijuana, right? And I'm like, oh, my God. So luckily, he came up with me, but um, there's a lot to learn, just to know that. Oh, look at that. Who's that? We got a picture of Ashley up there. <laughs> And that should be part of the collaboration, right? Just collaboration. Um, 2014 legal weed dispensaries, again, not a big problem for us. Like it or hate it, doesn't matter, right? Take your bias out of it. The legal dispensaries are not a big problem. Are there problems? Yes. Are there major problems? Not very many. Um, excise and license, we created a new position where I have three detectives in excise and licensing that deal with the illegal issues that affect the licensing of licensed facilities. Very important for your agencies and your cities to have people that work with your licensing department that can actually do the enforcement piece. Very important. Um, dual licensing, I mean, we're, we're definitely running out of time here because I want to leave you guys time for questions. Um, where we are today. So um, now really we have three teams. Um, and let's go to, <laughs> I talked about streamlining citizen complaints, advanced PPE. So you guys can write down and look up Toker Poker. I'll play this real quick. I hope you guys can play this for me. Um, this is an organized crime. So I guarantee you in your cities, you have organized crime with marijuana. This is investigation that, that we had in Colorado through our unit. But the reason I'm bringing it up, because we have other ones, is this started on a citizen complaint. So just play like two minutes of it being called the biggest pot bust in state history. A massive ring broken up as dozens of people were illegally shipping marijuana to other states. Our Jeff Todd and taking a closer look researching the case. Jeff, the big break started with a simple tip. Jim, we're told somebody noticed inside a grow warehouse that there were some illegal plants and this entire syndicate started to unravel. At this location, more than 100 plants were seized. While that's the most for any one location, it's just a fraction of what this group was responsible for. Neighbors tell us this house had a few people come and go, but no signs that there was a substantial grow operation inside. 36 plants were taken from here in the spring. My one neighbor did say that it was a full-on raid, uh, SWAT team, guns, that, that's everything. Probably good. So uh, we had over 40 different addresses on this house, uh, $1.5 million in cash. But what, what I want to bring this up is, besides that one warehouse you saw, these are all residences. These are all in your neighborhood and actually my neighborhood. Um, so it's something that all started from a citizen complaint, right? So will the voters serve the voters? That's the type of stuff we look at. Uh, back to the coordination, I do want to get to your questions. Um, community outreach, this is what, what is really, really important to me, and it's education piece. So just recently we've started a marijuana monthly thing, um, Instagram, Facebook, and this is something that we put out, which is actually kind of funny. I think you guys got to play this one too. And then we'll, we'll obviously we'll you have a backyard grow. We have a search warrant for it. If you're just standing on the sidewalk, you can see the buds poking through there. What you have right here and what you see right here is not legal. Anytime you grow in the backyard, unless it's in a locked and closed structure, it's 100% illegal. We're the actual marijuana unit. We're complaint driven, and we have anywhere from 60 to 80 complaints in our queue at any given time. Violent crimes associated with marijuana are usually related to outdoor grows. They see the marijuana not so much as a recreational drug, they see it as money. That's a cause of some home invasions. We've had shootings, stabbings, burglaries, homicides, you name it. We've pretty much covered the gambit as far as these outdoor grows go. You have to be able to prevent anybody under the age of 21 from gaining access to the marijuana plants. The heart of the law was supposed to keep it out of the hands of the kids. Bag, we need to make sure we're enforcing that so it actually stays out of the hands of the kids. That's the law, so now you know. So that last part, that's the law, for now you know. The detective was Mike's talking to the resident, and he didn't know that he was going to play that, but it just worked out well. So um, I, that's all we have. Maybe if the public guys want to come up here, and we'll answer any questions that, that you all have for us. 
Um, so if you have something, throw it out for us. Anybody? Wow. Good, no. Are no knock warrants common to dispensaries? Like with the illegal growth, right? is that something you guys implement? So no knock warrants are very highly regulated yes. by the no. courts, and the, there are certain criteria that they have to meet. I have never seen a no knock warrant on any marijuana girl in the five years I've been doing this, nor do I ever anticipate doing one. Nor have I. And a no knock warrant, what, what this lady's asking, a no knock warrant is is something that you have to get extra approval for the district attorney's office through the command level because most warrants are knock and announce. You give the people a chance. You knock on the door, you give them a chance to open the door, more compliance, safer for everybody, including the people inside. No knock warrants are where you just hit and go. I've never seen one in marijuana either in Denver. Uh, if you have, I'd love to talk about that. Never seen one. Yeah, and especially a dispensary type. Uh, I right. finally caught a part on a dispensary. Yep. We don't need that any warrant really to get into the dispensaries and we're Look at regulatory right. side to that. Um, yeah, totally different animal with a no knock type situation. Dispensaries have to be completely open to law enforcement, usually depending on how the county ordinances are worked. For a club, we're the same as any deal we go to the dispensary, so they have to be completely open to us. Same as us. The same, yep. same as us. Does that answer your question? Anybody else? Everybody's like, it's Friday night, we're leaving. Yeah. Nothing else? I want to leave, have a beer. Just, just, just curious, this, this may sound a little ignorant, naive, and so I, I'll, I'll own that, but you talk about the, uh, the Cuban group. Is, I lived in Miami for 10 years. There was generically reference to the Cuban mafia. Is that the, that the same thing, the origin of this? Very, very close to the same type of setup. Um, we are in constant contact with several investigators in the Miami area. Um, we've actually seen some odd crossovers, according to what you're probably familiar with, as far as some of the different cultures out in that area. Um, we've had instances where we've got our Cuban groups actually working side by side with some Russian groups, moving from <laughs> nice guys. Location and things like that. Yeah. This is, yeah. This is our first interaction with the organized crime faction with the Cubans. And when we say Cubans, it's because the 95% of the individuals we're dealing with are actually Cuban nationals that have come to. Uh, the United States either got visas or IDs and stuff in Florida, mainly, and then moved to Colorado. We're actually seeing some that are Cubans here on visas now, and then going back to Florida. So that's that's why we're calling it a Cuban syndicate. That is their direct. Country. But they're they're replants. They're really North American now. I mean, it's not Cuba, Cuba. Okay. We're seeing a higher faction, and that's where we start to see a lot of the human trafficking coming into these groups. Um, they'll have some of the upper echelon type folks that are citizens, but they'll have a contingent to guys that are questionable status okay. within the country across the board. And we're seeing a big increase in that. We have, we have individuals that we've tracked back with illegal crossings coming uh, from Cuba through Mexico and into the United States. And they were caught with other bill flows like cocaine and stuff when they came through. Okay. Money. So, so the Mexican cartels are kind of a given, right? I mean, that's... That's, this that's is like an extension from them. Okay, yeah. all right. Yes, and and 420? Um, I, I didn't know what that was. I kept, I kept, I kept hearing 420, Denver 420. What 420? Is what is that? 420 is, is it? <laughs> Yeah, no, no, 420 is, we, we have, you should probably look it up because I probably can't do it any justice, but um, it's when a lot of people come here, it's the unofficial pot holiday. So they come here on April 20th, April 20th, which happens to be my birthday, believe it or not. <laughs> Congratulations. And I make you, yeah, I make you funny, work right? every 420. Yeah, right? I'm sorry. It's a really so, yeah. happy birthday. So, so I never get my birthday off, but no, anyway. Um, no, they, they come here to party, and then on, at 420 in the afternoon, everybody lights up in our Civic Center Park is pretty much what happens. They do it a lot of different places, too. It's yeah. not just Denver. Well, you, you guys brought a, a whole other element and uh, energy to this conference, and oh, I, I really you. appreciate it. And I have a lot of respect for what you do. Thanks. Yeah. That's thank nice you. To see you. Thanks. He's got one, I think. Yeah, just uh, just briefly. I'm from Maine. We, we've legalized now, and we're in the process of getting some state regulations put in place. Do you have any recommendations on things that we can do on a regulatory level to maybe? take out some of the black market attractiveness. I know I've heard through this conference the 99 plant thing oh. is just way too high. Um, right now we're at 36 plants for a medical marijuana caregiver, um, which is also too high. 
You know, absolutely, and it's something, and I know we met the other night at the, the other thing, it's something that we can talk offline. There are, there are probably dozens of things that we can tell you that we didn't put in place when we started that caused a lot of problems, that led to a lot of citizen complaints that we've now put in place. Um, absolutely, we'll be happy to talk with you about that. Um, in fact, before I leave, make sure I get your email Question. address. I, I might already have it, but um, it's something that, again, the, and I'm so glad you're gonna have distribution on the East Coast, so it's not all coming from <laughs> here. Maybe that'll take some pressure off our black market here. Um, but yes, absolutely. We, we made a lot of mistakes. Luckily, we were able to work with the legislator and, and move forward. I'd be happy to talk with you about that. It'll take us a while to, on the learning curve to get as good as you guys are. Oh, I don't know about that. We're not there. Thank you. Marijuana was legalized in 2001, and we're still learning. <laughs> right, yeah. Kind of put the cart before the horse, I think. <laughs> they didn't see the forest for the trees when it started moving. Right. They moved quickly once it started rolling. <laughs> right. Hi. I was wondering, do you know if the illegal grows are happening in other states where it's uh, where, where there isn't a legalization going on? Um, because I'm wondering, the illegal grows from the Cubans, for example. When you showed us the photo of the house, it seemed like it was over a hundred plants. So it's illegal anyway if it's in Colorado or in a different state. So can you uh, can you tell me something about why they come here to do it if it's illegal? Anyway, to answer your question, and kind of gigs into his, is Colorado, when we enacted Amendment 20, we did this nice little subsection that says that you are allotted six plants unless a doctor thinks you may need more, and you could use that as an affirmative defense in trial. Well, the education that Lieutenant Howard hit on is big because law enforcement was afraid that once they had that paper that said a doctor recommended that they needed 99 plants, that, that was, they were 100% good. So initially, we'd go and we'd look at it and then we'd walk away because they had this paper, even though there's more things to it. That's what made them come to Colorado is because a lot of cops will go look at it okay, they've got 100 plants, I know they're still doing this with it, but they're legal and I can't prosecute them and walk away. And to answer your question, yes, they do grow it in other states. I've talked to detectives in Florida and other officers in Kentucky where the same Cubans will operate grows there. They just have a higher rate of prosecution. And, and let me add to that, what's happening in Colorado is because it is legal, the neighbors will know their next door neighbors are growing marijuana, but let's say, oh, it's legal, I'm just not going to mess with it. So, so they, they don't call us. They can just hide it in plain sight. Right. Exactly. I think something particularly, a big reason that we've seen such an influx with it in our neck of the woods, and we've got this from people when we talk to them, well, why'd you come to Colorado? Why'd you come to Pueblo to Colorado? <laughs> of all places. Right. It's a great point. And the way that a large group of them say, well, I Googled where the cost of living was reasonable, and I could get the most government assistance. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. That's another you know, high risk spot that I've been in Pueblo Falls on the map. Um, so they can come down into our neck of the woods, get a large par parcel of property, hide in plain sight, and roll the dice that we're going to come knock their door down at some point. And that's just the risk they're willing to take. We used to see a lot more commercial grows where there were big grows and they'd have a bunch of people like a co-op where they all have their paperwork. But the fire department's actually done a fantastic job and they inspect all the buildings twice a year now. And if they can't get in, sometimes they get administrative warrants. So it's just, it doesn't behoove them anymore to grow in these big ones. So now they're moving into residences, which you're seeing with all of us. Yeah. Sir? Hey guys. So knowing this was coming, did you guys prepare, underprepare, and if you underprepared, where did you underprepare uh, for legalization? Ooh. You got an hour? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you want to start on that one? I think our biggest, where we underprepared, the, the biggest portion on that was the regulatory side, frankly. We have all of these things, you can do this, you can do this, you can do that. But then we didn't have any real criminal charges with teeth, per se, to be able to back up when someone did step outside the guidelines or step outside the rules. Now we've been, you know, running threefold to catch up to be able to get up to that point. But I think a big thing was is we just they didn't have enough regulation on the front side, um, and that put us way behind the curve because we didn't start seeing all the holes in our system until you had these groups of attorneys and these groups of corporation type people that were capitalizing on all those loopholes and then we were getting caught on the backside trying to figure out a way to patch that hole. Okay. Um, we were starting something new that nobody knew 
where the loops and where the holes are going to be. And when they initially wrote the marijuana laws, they didn't write them like typical laws are. Typical laws are wrote, written where you shall do this or oh, may do this. Um, marijuana laws were initially written where you could do this or you should do this. So there is very broad interpretations. Yeah. And when you get into the legal side of that, that's a totally different meaning than just regular conversation on one word. And we weren't prepared for the amount of citizen complaints. I, I had no idea the citizens would complain as much as they do. And to be honest with you, the first couple of times I wanted to ask if they voted for it, but I didn't, because we will the voters, right? I took the oath. Well, and honestly, I've right now I'm very different. So that's why he's a lieutenant, and I'm sorry. We'll still open my mouth. Um, I had actually asked some folks when we were starting to get really in a day of these residential grows. I'm like, well, you know, in conversation, did you vote for it? Well, yeah, I didn't vote for it to be next door. Right, and the. the right. And. Right, and, and the idea of voting for it so it would make law enforcement less, less burdensome on law enforcement so we could do other stuff has not been the case so far in Denver. I mean, my teams have gone from five to 16 or 17. Um, maybe it will someday, but right now it, it hasn't been the case. So we weren't really prepared for that. Okay. And another point, as Lieutenant Howard mentioned, you don't see much to do as a cop, but with marijuana industry, initially when the laws were written, they didn't worry about marijuana extract extraction. So BHO extraction just became illegal two years ago after people started blowing up their houses. It wasn't something that we had ever thought about. We ever realized there was gonna be a problem. We ever realized there was gonna be a danger to it. And so, ironically, it's become one of the most stringent, the highest ranking crimes. It's a yep. DF2 now, yep. I believe, um, yep. when you're, you're using that uh, BHO extraction process because you're using an inherently hazardous substance. Hmm. Um, that was something we really had to prepare for uh, when we started getting into BHO stuff is that BHO vapor is heavier than air, so it settles. It's got a very low flash point. We were always walking into the high explosion potential, and that's, you know, being that public safety issue for the average citizen. They've now given us a law that has the proverbial team to be able to go after them when they are that. I'd, piggy I'd piggyback on that and say that um, there was a lot of gray area and nobody knew, there wasn't any case law as well. So now we're getting better, good case law. And we also have um, people in the city that support us and are actually making more laws that are making it more stringent um, beforehand. So a after the fact, we started seeing a problem and we all got together and made, made laws for that because we didn't have them. Okay, and then on that note too, I don't know if you can answer or not, uh, internally, did you guys have to change policy? Uh, for your officers, obviously, and, and what not is there, um, and what is that? We, we didn't have to change policy for our officers, per se. I presume you're going toward usage and things like yep. that. That's still a moot point at any law enforcement agency that I'm aware of in the right. country, really. Yep. Um, it's still federally legal, therefore, you can't just fight on top to be able to grab their medical marijuana cards. Um, we did have to make a lot of changes um, policy wise as far as when we started getting into hiring guys. Um, I've been 18 years in law enforcement. I've been in narcotics for 12 years. We're dealing with guys now where, you know, they smoke weed two weeks after they got out of the academy. It used to be, okay, that's, you can't do that. Now, you know, our, our office has been forced to shorten that length of time for usage. We still do drug testing. We still do all those things. Um, a lot of our other policy change came in, our processing, our storage, um, because it's just volumes uh, once we got into it. Luckily, at my agency, we had a lot of support from, from our sheriff, um, who really started driving this bus, and uh, it has allowed us to, you know, I told him when we got started, I said, boss, if we're gonna do it, we're going all in. We're not gonna sample plants. We're not gonna leave their grow. We're not gonna leave their grow equipment. If we're gonna task my guys with doing this type of work, we're taking the, all their plants, we're taking all their equipment, we're probably gonna make some case law somewhere, right, wrong, or indifferent, but somebody's gotta do it. And he sat back, and then, all right, I'm on board with you. And uh, you've kind of been off and running since. Okay. Yes, guys. Sure. Sure. We got all the time you guys need. <laughs> um, I'm from Nevada, and um, probably like here, there's strict rules about who can own dispensaries and operate them. I know you guys deal with the illegal side. Is there any chance, any possibility? And these people are, you know, their background checked FBI, the whole nine yards, just go crazy. Um, is there any possibility that the cartels could infiltrate the legal, the people that are, act, I mean, like threaten them? Or? There, there's always a possibility. 
or have you seen it? I have done criminal cases on dispensaries, but usually it's, it's very heavily regulated and tracked. Every time a seed goes in the ground, as soon as the plant gets so high or they do a clone, it has to have a radio frequency ID on it. Not only do they have to do those things, the Marijuana Enforcement Division for the state will go in and do regulatory inspections. I'll go in and just went on board and go walk through a dispensary and come up with regulations. And then our local municipalities and authorities have licensing and regulation that they go through and do it. So, so you basically have to count plants every week. They would have nothing to gain from it. They're right. cutting into the profit margin to keep right. their plane by the um, They're not looking to obey the rules or have a Bless legitimate you. business. They're, they're going to keep doing it the way they've been doing We haven't seen any change in our outdoor cartel rows from the first one I went on 18 years ago to what we're still seeing today. So that hasn't changed. Um, I honestly wonder why they're even still fiddling around in that field because it's the market's flooded domestically. I can't yeah. imagine they're making a whole lot of money. So we had just a little bit different, I agree with these guys, it's changed and evolved. We had the Phantom Pain case, where we started with the DEA and that was tied into some of the dispensaries, but that's been three to four years ago. So um, there was some of that um, going on at one point, but it was only, you know, we've got over 400 licensed places or, you know, with all our MIPS and stuff in Denver, that was only one or two places. So. Could it always happen? Of course, but I mean, it's re really well regulated in our opinion. Where we've seen any questionable involvement has been some things that the state has worked on as far as funding and things go for dispensaries. Um, is being able to know whose money is going right. to be funding that right. operation. Right. Um, I think on the, in the get-go, there was some of that where it mm -hmm. wasn't regulated, so there was a potential for them to be you know, silent partners type of thing. And then they change ownership. Yeah, yes. Exactly. Constantly. So it's... There's potential, but I don't, it's okay. not something we've dealt with. Okay, um, thank just, you. Just the one. <laughs> thank you. Anybody else? I've got a question. Um, our department, I think, is like yours, where when the state Supreme Court said we're going to follow the Federal Control, Control Substances Act, and the yep. police are dealers if they return marijuana, so our property and our things were just said we do not return marijuana under these circumstances when it's safekeeping on mm -hmm. the rest. Mm -hmm. Have either of your departments experienced any civil lawsuits because of that? Because of that specific thing, no. We've been sued plenty of times since our marijuana <laughs> enforcement, <laughs> including me personally. Well, um, no. We've never been sued for that. We've been sued when a case has been thrown out in the past, then we've been sued for. Um, you know, um, constitutional amendment rights for illegal search warrants and that type of stuff. But we have not paid a settlement, and, and I, that I can remember, Marley's still here. Marley, I don't think we've paid a settlement back for any marijuana evidence ever taken in Denver, have we? And Marley's city attorney's office, so no. And, there you go. When we first got started, that was everybody's worry. Oh, we're going to get sued. Well, we're going to roll the dice. We might get sued, but it won't be because we're doing anything illegal. Right. We'll probably make some case law, but we're going to come out in the, in the sunshine on the end. And I just stuck to my guns. My administration managed to stick to their guns on every time they have an argument. You're going to get sued for this because of that. Well, no, here's this Supreme Court case law that says, no, that can't happen because of this, X, Y, Z. And, and we do not return anything. And, and, and not, absolutely not. not only does Krauss protect us in the fact that we don't return it, but then Young versus Larimer County will also protect us because that case law states that you aren't taking something if it's within a legal authority or legal search. So if you're arresting somebody and search intent to arrest, that's contraband in the jail, so you put it in the property, it's a legal search, it's a legal seizure, so you're, you're going to be protected on it. I mean, it's supposed to be anything, you know, yeah. it's illegal enough because we have lots of you, you can't leave it out where it's access to the public. It's not like you can throw it in the trash can or anything where a juvenile can get it. So I think the case law is going to support you on that. Yeah. Not yeah, only Krauss, but Young versus County. Our county never said, no, we're not returning anything, but yeah. the, you, know, oh, you still get the naysayers. Yeah. And it's just stick to your guns. It, and it's more and more. Promise damn lies. That you're right. <laughs> yeah, it's Krauss. Anything else? If not, it's Friday and we're going to get out of here. No, nobody else? All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you.